I mean, that would be my advice is that you have to play not to have any regrets after the game, you know, because if you have a smallest slight opportunity to make him in trouble, just grab it. Because imagine you don't grab it and then you lose shamefully and then you would think after the game, oh shit, why I didn't play that move? That shouldn't happen because you may not be able to play, you know, Hikaru or Magnus again in your life, you never know. So just grab any opportunity and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you're gonna lose, not a big deal. Analyze the game with the engine afterwards and just check it out. Hi and welcome, it's Runchex and you're listening to my podcast where I explore the topics around what it takes to become a great poker player with various interesting people from in and around poker industry. Today my guest is Grandmaster Robert Fontaine. We are continuing to explore the parallels between poker and chess. Robert shares some really interesting things about top-level chess tournaments. We talk about the rising popularity of chess and the lessons that the poker world can take away from it. And there's so much more. Enjoy. Robert, such a pleasure to have you on. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Well, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because, uh, you know, I'm always fascinated by chess as an amateur. And to me, you know, the achievement of becoming the grandmaster, which is obviously the pinnacle of of the whole thing, uh, the work that it entails and the work ethic and all that comes with it is just incredible. So I'm I'm really looking forward to digging into that and uh, and exploring exploring what it takes to become a grandmaster and what it takes to to remain at the very very high level. So maybe if you can um, give us a few words about yourself first, and then we dive into it. Yeah, sure. So my name is uh, Robert Fontaine. I'm French, uh, basically coming from Paris, and I now live in Switzerland. Uh, because when I I have quit chess, my chess professional career, I decided to have like a normal job, you know, eight to six. So I, uh, it ha- just happened uh, that um, I came in, in Geneva and before I was working in, in London and then a bit in Moscow. Anyway, um, I started to play chess early uh, with my father. I think I was like almost five, not even five years old. It was quite young. And my father is not at all a chess player, so he learns me basic rules with wrong rules, actually. You know, in chess, you can you have a rule which is castling. Castling is when you have a king and a rook and you are switching the rook with the, with the king. And at the time, he, he learns me that, no, castling is with the, with the king and the queen. Completely wrong, right? <laughs> so I come in the first time in, first time in my um, chess club close to Paris. And then I start to play with my own rules. And the guys look at me like, okay, what are you, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so it was quite fun. Um, but then, you know, I started to, to really enjoy the process of playing. And I started my first competition. I was eight years old and it went quite nicely. Uh, I won the qualification to the French Youth Championship. It's by category, so you have under 10, under 12, under 14, and so on, until under 20. And I won my first French championship. I was, I think, eight or nine years old, nine years old, actually. And so I kept going uh, in the youth competitions in France. Uh, I won six or seven titles, so that was quite good. Quite good. I had schools, of course, and at the same time. Um, and I became international master. I think I was 15 years old, so I was teen going to school, you know, playing my French chess championship youth, playing with adults. Uh, I got qualified many times for the European and world chess championships. And there I saw the difference, you know, of, uh, of the Russians, uh, Chinese, Indians, guys, young kids being fully involved. I'm not quite sure they were going to f- school full time. And, you know, us as West U- Western Europeans uh, challenging school plus chess activities. And of course, you know, I didn't perform well, but it was a very interesting experiences. Anyhow, I kept playing uh, and, and became grandmaster. I think I was 21 year old, um, which was a, a, a great success. Um, so basically to, to, for our auditors to understand that uh, in chess, you have what they call a ranking. So uh, it's a, you, you have a rating starting at 1,000. So if you are a, a completely complete beginner, you start at 1,000. 
And then you grew up, right? Right? You play against a guy who is uh, 1,500 ratings, you beat him, you, you go up and so on. To become a chess international master, you have to reach the rating of 2,400. And in parallel, you have to perform three performances of above. So not going into details, same principle for grandmaster, you have to be above uh, 2,500 and be a grandmaster. So I got grandmaster, I told you, at 21, I guess. Um, and I was 2,500 something. Now you have to understand that the world champion, Magnus Carlsen from Norway, is 2,850. And now the gap between 2,500 and 2,800 is huge, actually. You know, it's much more easy to get from 1,200 to 1,500 than 2,500 to 2,800. And the, the difference is, is, is enormous. It's really such a gap. So, Yes, being a grandmaster is the highest level you can reach. But in chess, you know, you have grandmaster and grandmaster. I'm not considered as a grandmaster like Magnus Carlsen, of course, or Gary Kasparov, or, or you, you name them. Um, so yeah, basically that was my, 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 my chess career. After uh, high school, uh, I, I did two years of university. But then, you know, when you start a prof prof professional chess career, whether it's chess, poker, or any other sport, you are committed heavily, you travel a lot. So you go to play a tournament, a chess tournament takes roughly 10 days. Uh, so, you know, you, you have to prepare for the tournament, you have to do some sports, you, you go there, you, 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 are, you are wasted after 10 days, you go back. There's no way you can, you know, work or learn at university. So at one point you have to make a break, right? So I decided to, to be a professional chess player for five, six years. Um, in 2004, I played for the national French team in the uh, Olympic Games. So they call, they call it Olympiads. Uh, that was my, it was a great experience. You, 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 we were facing the best players in the world. We played against Russia, we lost, but it was great. I mean, um, and after some point in 2007, uh, I had an offer to work for a, a media a chess company. And I thought it's a nice transition from being a professional chess player to have like a, you know, kind of normal career because unlike poker, uh, chess uh, has, uh, you know, uh, very low prices. Um, to give you an idea, uh, you have nowadays a, a tournament of, I don't know, I would say 200, 300 chess players coming from all, the, all over the world. And uh, the first prize can be 2000 euros. Uh, and it's impossible to win this tournament because you have all those grandmasters coming from Russia, you know, and they are so strong and they come and they, and they just want to beat you and, and get those pricing. You have 10 prices, right? So you pass 10 days in some hotel uh, and you can lose everything on the last game. So it's one game per day. You play nine games in a, in a, normal, in a classic open tournament. All right. So you try it. You are young. You travel. It's cool. You travel over, over the world. Um, I was actually in, in, in Vegas, but we can discuss later about that. Anyway, uh, so at one point, either you are extremely good, you are a professional chess player, you can live from that. Or another solution is, okay, you are good enough to be a coach, but you have to have the you know, patience and skills to be a trainer, which is fine, which I don't have. Or you try to switch completely, and it, that was my choice in 2007. So roughly that's a bit of my career. Let me just point out one thing is uh, when you said early on, you said, well, you know, I um, thought about switching to a normal career, a normal job, eight to six. <laughs> For most people, the normal job is nine to five. So that just goes to show that, that for you, it's like you add a two extra hours and it's completely normal and everybody else is pretty lazy. Well, so, you know, it, it really depends on the company you work for. It, whether it's a big corporate or UN or, or a startup, you pick up your hours. Yeah, but still, I mean, even if it's 10 hours per day, uh, it doesn't compare to what type of hours you have to put in to, to uh, compete professionally in chess. True. So, and you know what? I, I'm just very curious about uh, that, that story of... Um, you know, you're coming into your first tournaments as a kid. Uh, what was the feeling? Because I, I was also competing at, at the same age. I started chess at five. And I mean, I never really 
took it seriously, but you know, as a, as a little hobby, started at five. I went to the tournament. I remember my feeling of being in the tournament. What was your feeling the first tournament? Uh, the very first tournament I played was very weird because it was qualification for the French Championship. And I remember it was very uh, local, regional, and there was just one kid of my age. So I had to play six games against him to qualify for another tournament to qualify for the French Championship. And I remember I won 6-0 against him, the poor kid. <laughs> and I didn't know any, I didn't have any point of comparison. Uh, so I just remember there was a, a coach of Paris who just said, okay, you won, you are qualified for the next turn. It's very hard for me to recall those feelings. What I can tell you, I can tell you my feelings of my third tournament, which was the French Championship. So I won against this kid 6-0. I qualified for the Paris Championship, which which were which were the, the the first three could qualify for the French Championship. I won it, um, and I played the French Championship. So you arrive. I mean, it was really my first real big championship. You arrive. It was in the south of France, in the city called Yer. I remember perfectly, and it was uh, you you play in some kind of big um, how you call it? Uh, it's a, like a, a stadium where you play basketball inside, mm -hmm. right? So you have all the parents uh, sitting, watching the kids and all the kids of all the categories. So we were more than 1000 kids playing and sitting close to each other. So I was very impressed by the immensity of all those children. And I thought, OK, those kids must be monsters. I mean, they qualify. They come from all of from all of the friends. You know, I, I'm coming from Paris, but there are guys from Marseille, Nice, whatever. So I'm going to lose. I was terrified. But then, you know, I started to play three, four games. I won all of them. And on the, in the fifth game, I made a draw. And I didn't even realize at the time that a draw is a perfectly nice result, right? I mean, the GMs, when they face each other nowadays, a draw is a most uh, common result in terms of percentage. And I did a draw. And for me, I didn't get it that, you know, the championship goes on. And I, I almost cried after the game. And, <laughs> And my, my parents say, okay, you know, we did all that way for you and you are almost disqualified. <laughs> that was such a drama. And then the coach of uh, the Paris came and he, and he said, you know, what the hell are you talking about? You have four games to go. You are still in the lead. I mean, come on, <laughs> just keep playing. So we kept, I kept playing I, and I had uh, seven and a half out of eight. So I just needed one draw in the last game to be French champion. And I remember very, very well, I, play, uh, uh, I played a small kid, uh, Adrien Hervé, who uh, recently, uh, a few years ago, died because he was a handicap. So his person was accompanying him. He was playing the, the, the moves for him and he was sitting there. And I could, I don't know, maybe because of the atmosphere, the intensity, I could even... Now, today, put the, put the position on the board. I, I can tell you that my last uh, checkmate pattern was you know, bishop on f6, queen on h6, and I played queen g7 mate. So I can tell you that I still remember that final position, which led me to the, to the title. And I recall very well at the time that when you finish a game, you had to raise your hands to call the arbiters. And uh, yeah, I, I won. I won the game. Um, I felt a bit sorry for, for the kid because he's, he was a very nice guy. Um, and I remember my parents looking at me uh, and they were waiting for, for me to raise my hand because if you raise your hands first, it means you won the game. I wanted to make a joke with them, so I didn't raise my hand. I waited for my opponent to raise the hands just to make them think uh, I lost, right? That I, I won. So anyway, all those details tell you that, yes, I, I think... I forgot most of my tournaments in my head, but that one, I can tell you, I still remember some very specific moments, even though it was, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, 30 years wow. ago. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Yeah. And so interesting also to go into what already you've mentioned a few times, you know, that you reach a certain level. Uh, you are not aware of your own level because you, it's hard to compare. Right. You, you 
like you go into this tournament thinking, okay, I'm going to lose because, well, there is everybody from everywhere and they all seem so really strong. Then the next time it happened was when you, as an international master, you, you played against all the Russians, all the Chinese, and even before that. It's... How, how the, Can you talk a bit more about it? Because I see in poker, it's very much the same. You know, it, it's as if you're playing your own game like if we make a poker analogy, you're playing your own regular crowd, your regular game, and you think that this is your level, whereas if you jump into another game, you sometimes have an eye-opener of, oh, I'm actually that much better than everybody else, or, oh, I'm actually really, really bad because I'm, I'm playing on a very shallow level and everybody else went much deeper. So can you just talk me through it? I'm, I'm quite fascinated about it. I, I think you feel it quite quickly. You feel the attitude of the guy. Uh, you feel how he plays. I mean, it's, I guess it's a bit like poker, right? You sit at, at the table, you see the, you, you, you can feel this type of emotion. When, when you play a strong player, in chess, you have a few different um, phases. You have what, what we call the opening, which are the 10, 20 first moves, then the middle game and, and the end game. The opening is a, a lot of theory with a lot of, uh, it's like pre-flop and flop, I would say, in, in mm. poker, right? Uh, and you can feel that the guy knows what, what he talks about. You, you, you can understand that he understands the subtlety of, I don't know, in chess, we have openings called uh, by uh, countries like French, Italian, Sicilian, uh, I don't know, you, you, there are dozens. And when the guy understands it and plays confident and quickly, you can understand that, okay, this guy, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time. Uh, and there is no bluff. Uh, of course, maybe the guy just learned complete theory and after he is lost, but that happens ra rarely. So when you play a, um, a strong Russian grandmaster, for example, you can already feel that he understands what, what he plays. And in chess, you have also the, the patterns and the plans which go after the opening. So you have a certain strategy accordingly to your pawn structure, to your, the, the position of your pieces, and you know where to go. And you can feel also that the guy, okay, knows his basics or he knows exactly where he wants you to go. Um, so I feel when you, when you play a, a, a strong chess player, you quickly understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of preparation, what do you think are some of the most important aspects? Because obviously, as you said, there's the, you know, there's the opening, there's the middle game, there's the end game. Opening leads to the middle game, and then you make the plan of which ending do you want to sort of uh, get into. All of the th those things, but like, if you had to choose one thing to study, what what would it be? Definitely not the opening, right? So if I always said to some kids who, who, who start to play chess, the, the, and it was the, the old grandmasters, the old generation, not the old grandmasters, the old generation of grandmasters, the Soviet guys, they were all saying the same thing. If you want to play good chess, you have to learn the end games. Not the, because, you know, the end games is when you have a few pieces on the board, right? If you are not able to win with a, I don't know, a king or rook, against the king, then there is no point, you know, of learning 21st moves of the games, you're going to be lost, you, do, you won't know where to go, what to search for. Um, so I'm taking the extreme example, right? But you, you have to know how to win with the very few pieces on the board. So it's, uh, we, we call it uh, your technique. So if you have a good technical end game, you can more or less, you know, survive because, okay, imagine you don't know, I'm, I can take my own example. I was always very bad in the, in the openings. Most of the cases, I, I had a very, very bad openings and I was worse after the openings. But then my, end, my, my middle game was fine. But then you have transitions from those uh, phases. So imagine you are having a, um, a difficulty in, a, in, the, in the middle game, but you know that, okay, I'm going to exchange the queens and from exchanging the queens, you arrive in the end game. 
and I will have a pawn down, but because I know my technique is good enough, I will be able to defend this end game. And I know that I will be able to draw it. Then it's fine. Then, then you know, you have to, you really have to, to learn end games. And that's the most important in chess. And I would keep saying that to anyone watching us mm. learn end games. And that's fine. And also imagine, so, so, so you have this type of end game, which is funny. You have a king, a king, knight and bishop against a king. Technically, this, you, you, this is easily winning, but uh, you have to have the technique. Otherwise, you're going to make 100 moves circling around the king and not knowing how to mate. And this is a very typical example. Many masters and grand masters don't even know how to mate with, with two piece up. You know, then it's a bit kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And but I've, of I've... Of course, yeah, of, co of course, you have to know the basics of all the phases. Mm -hmm. um, Taking extreme cases. Yeah, and I'm happy that you you brought um, the importance of the game end game up because I've heard it over and over again, especially from like you said, all the Russian school that was always the the sole focus of the studies. And the parallel with poker is is very much similar. That you know, if we think about pre flop and flop, obviously very important uh, streets because they sort of puts you in a position for future decisions, but uh, which is the same thing that happens in, in uh, chess very often. Just because you make the optimal decision, let's say the, the decision that the chess engine says, well, this clearly is the better line by a tiny margin. If you're not going to be able to execute the game plan further down the line, that, that tiny margin is only a margin on paper which is very much the same in, in poker when, you know, you might be making a decision that um, the solver slightly prefers, but if you are going to be lost after that, if you arrive at the end game with two pieces up, but those pieces happen to be the, you know, the bishop and the knight and uh, you can't win, well, then what was the point? Yeah, exactly. It's like having a, a winning position in poker and you pass because you don't know what to play instead of raise. Mm -hmm. I mean, what 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 are all the efforts for then? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so let's talk about you know the, to achieve the grandmaster level. So much work goes into it to maintain that level, that rating level. How much work goes into that? A lot. <laughs> um, I, I guess it all depends where you want to where you want to go, right? But uh, when I was pro, I was doing that a few hours a day. Um, there was no way to not be up to date to the latest games which are played. So you have computers to analyze your games engines, but you have also big database which are gathering all the latest games which are played everywhere in the planet, and you have weekly updates. <clears throat> so with this, with those weekly updates, you are up to date with all the latest theory. We call it novelties. So you have to keep up. You have to update your own uh, opening. Um, you have to practice. You have to study end games. And this is just endless, right? Uh, on top of it, and I think it's very important, and to me, it's a bit uh, undervalued, is the, um, the physical um, shape you have to have. Um, so everyone was advising to, to run, for example, because a chess game roughly an average of a chess game, maybe four hours. So you can always stand, you can eat, you can walk, but still you have to keep focus for at least four hours, I would say. So if you don't have the physical shape, you know, uh, you're going to collapse. Um, but of course to keep the, the grandmaster level, it's a, yeah, it's a full-time job. Um, you have to work, you have to share, you have to have a team, of course. I mean, the, those guys who are on the te top 10, they have full teams behind them. They don't have only engines, right? You have to share ideas, you have to have few inputs. Uh, if you take Magnus Carlsen, he has a main coach who is Peter Ein Nielsen, and Peter Ein is gathering the inputs of all the other grandmasters working for them. So it's not only going directly to Magnus, it's, you know, there is few few steps before. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, you have to have talent, you have to have uh, dedication, and you have to have a team. It's a combination of everything. A guy like me, you know, when I was pro, 
I didn't have any team. I had friends who were grandmasters and we were exchanging ideas, practicing. Uh, but you know, comes the, the the moment when you when you need money. Also, you need funding for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question of of the teams is so interesting because we experience the same thing in poker as well, especially recently. The the more you look around, and every top player, they have some sort of team behind them. You know, because again, the information is abundant. Like like in chess, you you have all these novelties of the full database. You know, you could spend every day, the whole day, just looking through the information. But that's probably not the best use of your time. You're better off getting the digested version and then digging deeper into it. And speaking of funding, um, chess turn tournaments like the ones that you've mentioned, where you know a hundred people from all around the world, top level grandmasters, are going to show up and compete for a prize of two thousand euro. Yet, chess is so popular, and arguably is experiencing some sort of renaissance, especially now recently where, you know, there's more and more buzz around chess on Twitch, on, on YouTube. Of course, Hikaru started uh, streaming and immediately got a huge follower base. How do you explain the popularity of chess? I don't know. It's an ancient game. Uh... To learn the basic rules of chess is not that complicated. Uh, it's, a, it's a game. So you have two guys playing each other. You have a, a clock, so you have time management. So it's quite, at some level, entertaining. Um, and I believe, and I'm not the one inventing this, that um, with this coronavirus, as you said, now all the guys are becoming YouTubers, tw Twitchers, and, and, and it's fun to watch because they speak their mind. Uh, and this is maybe what is what was lacking in chess that, you know, when you watch two guys playing a chess game, being silent for four hours and you, are, you know, just the basic rules, you understand maybe 10 percent of what's going on. You, you, there is a flow in the head that you don't understand, that you don't see. Now with Twitch and YouTube, the guys, they speak their mind, you know, and it's very entertaining. And it's when I saw that two, three months ago. I immediately recalled a show I really loved in poker. Uh, and I hope the title is, is fine, but it was a few years ago and it was Dans la Tête d'un Pro. So um, it was one team of poker, and I will not say the name because I, I don't want to mix up, but basically you were following one guy playing the World Championship in Vegas. He was a, almost arriving at the final table and there was a crew filming him and then you know, they were editing the, the, the whole uh, championship a few weeks later. And the guy was explaining you, okay, I recall that move and I was thinking like this and like that. And a few years ago, so poker was ahead, you know, I, mean, I think it was like 10 years ago, probably. And it was great. And me as a non-poker player, I understand the rules, of course, but I know as, as a like complete beginner, I say, wow. That's super cool because they make you understand, you know, the statistics, uh, why he passed, why he raises, his emotions and so on. And just now in chess, you can start to have the same type of feelings that, okay, chess is becoming now, as you say, popular because the guys are explaining what's going on. Of course, in chess, you have always uh, commentators. You know, when you have a world championship, you have always commentators who explain you of course, what's going on, but it's much more entertaining when the player itself tells you what he thinks about, why it goes that way, and what he misses also, mm -hmm. because you can match it with the, with the engine. Yeah, so, and especially yeah. especially when you're listening to them explain that in real time, it's as if you're following their thought process in game. So exactly. it's much more valuable than just the commentary because you you see, you learn the way to think in a way. Are there some famous YouTubers on poker? There are. And actually, I'm glad we started talking about this because clearly Twitch and YouTube is driving a lot of interest to chess. In, in poker, 
we have a few people which are really, really entertaining, really interesting. But the, the thing of poker is it's quite a diverse field. There are tournaments, there are diff, uh, cash games, there are different variations of poker, No Limit Hold'em, Pot Limit Omaha, et cetera, et cetera. I could, you know, th- we don't have enough time to name all of the games and, and uh, variations. But in some aspects, like let's say the tournaments, there is more content out there. Because, you know, a tournament is a fun format in, in many ways because it has the beginning and the end. There's a prize. There's there's the flow. You know, you have the ups and downs. In a cash game, it's much more sort of anticlimactic because, well, if you lost your your stack, you lost all your chips, all you need to do is rebuy and <laughs> the game keeps <laughs> going, right? So so sort of the, the stakes of uh, losing are not as severe because in a tournament you lost your out and that's it you're you're going home now pretty much so i think in poker first of all that there there's one niche that has good coverage and there's one niche which has not so great coverage but another aspect to it is because there's quite a bit of money involved so for the people at the highest level uh, let's say somebody equivalent of the skill of hikaru nakamura for them to share their um, thoughts while playing poker, almost nobody wants to do it. Because the perception is, if I share my thoughts, I give too much information to my opponents, and they're going to take advantage of it. And I'm not sure if it's true, and I'm going to, I'm really interested in your opinion about chess, whether, you know, these people are actually giving something up and giving something away while streaming. But my own perception is, because I am streaming occasionally, right? I would be streaming a couple times a week. And obviously, I'm not at the level of equivalent of Hikaru, but it's a pretty good level. And, you know, the, the, let's say the, player pool of my opponents is a pretty limited field, right? We can pretty much count these people. We know who they are, the people that I play against. And initially, when I went into streaming, my concern was, oh, well, I'm, I'm giving up so much information. But then if I think about it logically, I can't imagine any of my opponents actually going through the hassle of watching all of those videos and, and uh, coming up with a strategy. Of course, then we come to a point where if they have a big team of people who can uh, basically give them the highlights, then it becomes a problem. But the question is, do they have a team? And I know that I'm basically giving them ideas right now, but (laughs) I think it would be still a pretty big waste of their time. You you, you know, if you're a good player, you're a good player, right? They can analyze hours and hours, but at the end of the day, still, there is a practical uh, view of it. I mean, when you play, you have emotions, you have um, feelings. So, okay, back to Hikaru. Hikaru, I didn't check all his streams, but I know what a, a, a very strong GM could watch and his team could watch. The, the 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 stream of Hikaru, but first of all, he's not playing his main theory openings. So he's playing some random, you know, very side s- small sidelines. So there's nothing to take from his uh, um, theory or openings theory. So no input there. Then you know, you know, you have uh, mil- billions of chess games. All the games are different. It's like in poker, right? So. What can you take from this? Not much, in fact, because first of all, it's blitz. It's three minutes games. And the guy will explain you, okay, I'm thinking like that, 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 but all the patterns, all the positions are different. So what can you extract from that? It's very difficult. Of course, I mean, a full team can say, okay, he's always missing this type of tactics. He's always comfortable with a, a knight more than a bishop in open positions or close positions, or he prefers the part and rook plus knight versus rook plus bishop. You can probably extract uh, some information, but first, as you say, you need a full team dedicated to that. I'm not sure you want to pass. You pay your guys 
watching Hikaru. Second, you must have very strong guys to extract the you know patterns. I'm pretty sure a guy like Magnus could watch two hours of Hikaru and extract himself some patterns. But you have to be really strong on that. Plus, yeah, I'm not quite sure if this is very very valuable. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's doable. But I believe if you are strong, you can put ten guys watching you. You're gonna kick the ass of of your of your opponent because you are just strong. So I I don't think uh, streaming would give you know very very high importance information. Uh, I mean Magnus Carlsen is streaming. He's playing the World Championship next year. He doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. And his streams are really entertaining. By the way, I really what like watching him. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's quite important what you you said about you know. Sure, you can get some information, but what does it really help you? Because in the end of the day, in chess and same as in poker, you will have the time limit for making your decisions. So exactly. just because you have um, this idea, okay, my opponent is likely to miss a specific tactic. How do you force him into a position where that tactic is going to be uh, present? You know, as, especially if you are still playing with the time pressure, you can't just focus in on one thing. Okay, I'm going to exploit this one tiny thing because, like you said, the 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 number of moves, the possible moves, is just infinite. So you can't really guide it in there. And I guess what uh, I'm getting at, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. And and don't forget, in chess, you have database of millions of games so there is already this data you know mm -hmm. if they want to watch you know your past games of the 10 years you know welcome just go yeah. there put my name check yeah yeah exactly and i guess that's the difference between chess and poker because in poker there is no public information fortunately because that would that would give an unfair advantage and in fact but it, why? It, i mean if everyone imagine you're the same in poker Imagine mm -hmm. I can have access to your last 10 years of games and everyone has access to everyone's games. Right. It will create an imbalance um, for the hardworking people and probably with people with more finance, uh, with more money, because they can hire people to, to make the analysis. Because the, the problem with poker, well, it's not a problem, it's a beauty of poker. Everybody is still so bad compared to what's possible. <laughs> Right, the the general level is is pretty pretty low, and I I know that some people are under the impression that oh we're close to playing game theory optimal, and I think this is frankly bullshit. Mm. Um, so for that reason, there are so many ways to exploit your opponents. There are so many ways to find uh, their leaks. So the hardworking players would gain an advantage, right? Is it a bad thing it is a bad thing short term in the long term it would just raise the level of everybody at the top but because there is money involved it would also kill everybody on on the lower level and then eventually like what are we pay, uh, playing for because it might end up the same situation you know all the top players are just playing basically for fun to compete for 2000 uh, euro prizes or something like that it's yeah. unlikely to happen in poker but you know that that is one one possibility but yeah so even though there's no public information I, I still think that you know the top players wouldn't reveal all that much or at least much less than they actually think they're revealing by by streaming and my hope is that more and more people get into that because as you said you know for yourself uh, when you saw that poker show and you heard the thought process it makes you enjoy it. And if you're enjoying it, you might go in and play. And we obviously need to grow as any industry, any sport, you know, you need to grow, you need new people to come in for uh, the whole thing to be sustainable. And I just hope we can, we can follow a pattern that chess showed that basically, hey, you know, as soon as, as soon as people like Magnus and Hikaru start streaming, popularity of the game immediately rises so many yeah, more it, people playing so many more people getting into it uh, at the young age at any age to be honest it's a good education tool you know because when i was watching this poker 
dans la tête d'un pro, I understood that no, it's not about luck. There are statistics, there are probabilities, right? But you know, there is much more than that. And maybe for chess is is the same, you know. Oh, that's not that complicated. If I know the basic rules, you know, I can study a little bit. Of course, I will nev never get the, the, the levels of Ikaru and so on, but that's fun and I can enjoy it. So that can, as you said, that can bring more people into the games, mm. for sure. So let's talk about the levels of Hikaru and such. Because as you said, the difference, there are grandmasters and there are grandmasters, right? Yeah. Where is the difference? Everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Uh, the difference is in the ability of calculating fast, of understanding deeper the game. Uh, so it's a combination of many, many things, you know. I was speaking about physical shape. Physical shape between uh, Carlsen and his, I don't know, rivals will be a big uh, differentiator. The, if I have a much better physical shape than Carlsen, that won't help at all. You know, the guy will just crush me. So. Mm -hmm. He understands if I take Hikaru or no, I, I don't want to, to, to compare Hikaru and Magnus because I'm not the one who is able to do that. But if I take Hikaru Nakamura, he has a very, very, very big and deep understanding of the, of the, of the game. And that's a huge difference. He understands very fast the decisions he has to take. He understands very quickly which pieces he has to trade off to get a better position or to get a winning end game. And he is very fast and the patterns he has uh, are very clear and in his, uh, in his mind. So it's very hard to say, but you know, he's, I don't know what's his rating now, but he's 27, 50, 80, I don't know. And what's very impressive that he, this guy is much, much stronger than a guy who is 26, 50. And a 26, 50, Grandmaster is already much stronger than a 2550. So they are really, when I was saying that the gap is huge, it's really, really big. And I'm not even sure I understand to which extent Magnus Carlsen is strong, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm telling you in complete, honestly, I've been playing with Magnus one, two times online when there was this competition on some website. And you feel that, okay, the guy is just playing around with you, mm -hmm. you know? So, so, so he, in every level, in every uh, step of the game, he's better. He knows more theory. He knows more uh, the tactics, of course. Tactics is just a way to have a, you know, to, to achieve his strategy. But so everything is better. I'm not even speaking about end game techniques where yeah, Carlsen is maybe the best play, chess player ever in Endgame, in all the chess history, including all those guys like Fischer and Capablanca to me, uh, even though it's hard to, to, to compare, but I, I, I have this feeling. So it's um, every face of the, of the game is you know, you know, much better than you. And when you add it up, then that's a big difference. Hmm. I'm not even speaking about time management during a chess game, right? Which is an important factor, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of time management, actually, because if we think about a guy like Hikaru, who, as you said, he's so fast, he recognizes the patterns really fast. So he is probably the top player in Bullet and in, in Blitz. Sure. Uh, and oh, in, yeah, in Bullet. Well, yeah. at least in Bullet, for sure. I think yeah. in Bullet, he is, uh, he is always, always on the top. It's interesting to see that, you know, even in a game like chess, Obviously, there are variations because the time pressure changes the game. You can't approach the bullet game in the same way you approach a classical game because, well, you basically time out after three moves. Yeah. So, and in, in poker, it's, it's quite the same. You know, there are some people who are much better, or so they think, at reading people and, uh, you know, just making some, some sort of plays based on what they see physically. Mm. So they always stand by, okay, only the live poker is the real poker. Some people would um, play regular tables online 
which is another type of, of, of poker altogether because you take out all the physical tiles out of it. Then some people would go the in the route of playing very fast games, a lot of tables, the Zoom tables. So, you know, you have one to two seconds, something like that per decision, and they thrive in that environment. There are people who are happy to play anonymous tables so they don't actually have any information on on the players so there are so many variations of poker and i'm sure that based on the way people think based on the way their mind works there is a niche for everyone same as in chess because there are some people who are going to be always at the top in the bullet and some people like caruana for example i don't think he he can play bullet. I mean, I don't. I mean, he probably yeah. can. I mean, he, he's going to beat uh, you know m- most of the guys, but he's never going to be able to reach the levels of Hikaru. I think just just watching his but style. Hikaru is playing bullet since he's two years old. I feel like so he has <laughs> he has his habit, yeah, uh, and he has his training, of course, to play that fast. Mm. I'm not even speaking about moving fast the mouse. It's just too fast. It, and, you know, when you were talking about that, I was thinking, that, you know, in chess, you have, it's like a tree. You have a position and you have a, a tree of possibilities, right? So imagine you have three candidate moves, three main moves, one, two, three. And those guys, they have the ability to pick up always, almost always the best move. And they see it very fast. And while you are thinking, okay, what the best move is the position, there are three moves ahead you, already thinking, okay, what would be the best move three, he- three moves ahead? So that's impossible to compete in blitz or bullet because they have this, uh, you know, this capacity of uh, anticipation. Mm-hmm. And so the time management, yeah, they are just crashing you, in fact. Mm. When you were talking about, um, you know, the gap between, let's say, a twenty-five fifty and a twenty-six hundred, and then the gap further, further, so all these incremental mm. gra- gaps where it's not even comprehensible what exactly, uh, what is the quality that sets people apart in your career? What were some of the moments where you realized? Okay, now I see the whole thing in a completely different line or complete, completely different light, rather. You know, you reach a level where you think, okay, I got this. And then all of a sudden, oh, wow, there's so much more to it. <laughs> Can you talk me through some of those moments? Yeah. So you call it from hero to zero, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, from hero to zero, just to start over and to realize that, yeah. okay, there's, there's a new frontier. I don't know. You, you know, it's funny we speak about Hikaru because obviously you have plenty of very strong GMs in the world. But I recall when I was still active, I was roughly, I don't know what was my rating at the time, 25, 70 ish, whatever. And I played in French League against Hikaru Nakamura. And Hikaru at the time was, you know, a very, he was known as a very tactical player, you know, strong attacks, crushing and everything. So I was ready for this type of, okay, you're going to crush my king in a 20 moves attack. Well, let's fight. But at the end of the day, the game was just a long technical squeeze, suffering, five hours, I was sweating. And the problem of the game that I was white. So when you have white pieces, you are supposed to have an advantage. I fuck up the opening, fine. It's almost equal, equal, and then slowly, 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 he just overplayed me. And you are fighting the whole game to maybe hope for a mistake to get a draw, not to win, to get a draw only, which never happens with this type of guy. And I was pretty okay at the time, uh, you know, I was quite strong GM, you know, playing in a very good French team. We were a French champion or second. And then I was playing Hikaru, and then after the game with Hikaru, I understand that, okay, the guy, plus he's walking between the moves, he's, you know, he's very chilled, and he just kicked me. And I understood at this point, okay, there is, you know, quite a, quite a gap between me thinking, okay, I'm good GM and this type of top guy. 
And also recently in Swiss League, uh, I think it was two years ago, I'm still playing for uh, some league team in France and in Switzerland. And I played a very strong uh, Indian uh, grandmaster called uh, Pentala Hare Krishna. And he is known also for a very strong technical, uh, he has a very strong technical skills, but also tactical, of course. And when I, I drew the first game and two years ago I lost, and I also, f you, you feel that these guys, they are much higher and they have some, uh, you know, resources just in case something goes wrong. And he crushed me literally during my, our second encounter. So I still now, I have still, I think, uh, as you said, a decent level, even though I'm not practicing opening theory and so on, but I, my, my rating is stable, 2550. And this guy is 2750, I think. And I feel the difference. I feel that, yes, you know, I'm never gonna reach that level. And I'm pretty sure that if the guy for the second encounter took me seriously, okay, you know, he's much stronger. So yes, you, you feel you, you feel the gap. And I, I'm speaking about classical games, and I've played mm -hmm. very strong, uh, you know, GMs, top level GMs in Blitz. And but you have always this sensation that those guys, they have some some margin. You know, they have some error margin they could afford and still beat you. And that's uh, yeah, not very nice feeling yeah, <laughs> when you indeed. play them. So when that happens, let's say when you face Hikar or when you face uh, the Indian Grandmaster and you have an eye opener, okay, well, there's a huge gap. How do you use it? How do you use this information? Do you go back after the tournament? Do you try to understand what happened? Do you try to analyze? Do you try to learn from this uh, experience somehow? Yeah, of course. I mean, you have to analyze all of your games. So after, after the game is finished, of course, you you so even if you have a bad mood or you 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 made mistakes and you don't want to analyze, you always should analyze your game with your opponent if he accepts it, because then you see his process of thinking. That's the first step. Second step, you go back home, you put the game with your engine, and then you try to understand where are the mistakes. Of course, you need absolutely to do this process each time you play with those guys. This is the only way to progress in chess. First and the first rule ever is analyze your own games. Whether you lose or you win or you draw them, you have to check it with the, with the computers, which nowadays are super, super strong and, and uh, open source. So that's mandatory. There's no way. And I, I think when you play a top grandmaster, I mean, that would be my advice, is that you have to play not to have any regrets after the game, you know? Because if you have a smallest, slight opportunity to make him in trouble, just grab it. Because imagine you don't grab it and then you lose shamefully and then you would think after the game, oh shit, why I didn't play that move? Mm -hmm. That shouldn't happen because you may not be able to play, you know, Hikaru or Magnus again in your life, you never know. So just grab any opportunity and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you're gonna lose. Not a big deal. Analyze the game with the engine afterwards and just check it out. Because the worst thing which can happen is that you didn't grab this small opportunity. And then the engine tells you, yeah, of course, it was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and I suppose psychologically, if you grab it and you were wrong, you don't feel as bad about it because, well, I tried. And I, exactly. I, I, I went for it. Interesting. And you mentioned uh, if you have a chance, analyze the game together with your opponent. How often does that, does that happen? Like, would, let's say, Hikaru be okay with analyzing a game uh, yeah. together? Yeah. We did analyze with Hikaru. We did analyze with the Indian Grandmaster. Uh, you know, if they have time, if they have the good, a good mood, maybe... Well, they probably have a good mood day one. <laughs> so. And I used to win, you know. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, definitely you you have to. You, you, the, the guys are, are quite. Uh, they are nice. They are they are open and usually yeah you, they analyze with you. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you would think like one would think oh it has to be so competitive you know you guys are playing each other you're. Is it really in your interest to to help the other guy? Do you do you discuss everything like full information, or do you hold something back? 
Yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good, very good point you have. But it's form of respect. You know, you pass four or five hours in front of one person, and what you share hands and you go away without the word. No, and and for example, if you watch the World Championship match, Carlson Caruana, they can exchange. You know, after the game, right after the game. Of course, they will switch all the opening theory parts, not to reveal any secrets of their preparation. Mm -hmm. But as we said earlier, there are billions of games. And this position that arises after 30 or 40 moves will not arrive again, most likely, after move 40. So there is no harm in analyzing a key moment of the game, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, if both of them learn in the process, then it's a benefit for both of them. Theoretically, they both sort of edge that much higher above everybody else. So that is a, a great benefit, of course. And it's human nature. It's curiosity. You know, okay, what did you see here? I'm just curious. I mean, we are humans. We want to understand what's going on in your head at that point without mm -hmm. relieving, revealing, okay, secrets. Yeah. I mean, w would, you mind, would you mind sharing uh, uh, your analyze uh, uh, on the river with your opponent? Good question. Um, it really depends. It really depends because, well, one, one thing that happens in chess, for example, like you said, you play against Hikaru, you don't know when's the next time you're going to play against Hikaru, right? In, in poker, if you, especially if you play cash game, if you play tournament, that's slightly different because there's, again, the same aspect of we don't know when we're going to be in the same situation again. Uh, and by situation, I mean not only that we're at the same table, but also that our stack size situation is similar, that the ICM pressures are similar, all the other factors which, which sort of inform your decision and change your strategy at the moment. In a cash game, it's very likely you're going to see the same guy again because it's basically the same guys over and over again, especially once you reach a higher level, it's pretty much a very limited field. Now, would two top players hesitate to share information? They probably would, but they really shouldn't because, well, if both can gain something, then it's great. Would you want to share information of like a top player with a mediocre player in the field then it becomes a question of do both people gain something or is it just unilateral mm -hmm. right which is i don't know it's a sort of almost a philosophical question here because like what is what we're trying to achieve in poker because many people are only focused on how much money am I winning per hundred hands or per hour or whatever the metric is? For some people, it's about how much better can I be tomorrow than I am today? And if that's your perspective, then sharing and um, discussing everything with, with, your, with your opponents, with your friends, with just about everyone that you can, that's clearly a benefit. But it really depends on what is your perspective of what you're trying to do. Because the more incentivized you are by just the money, the closer to your self you're going to keep your cards, sort of, so to say. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because you know my hope is that poker could become more mainstream, more popular, but it doesn't seem that it's going that direction just yet because you know again you know many people are reluctant to share information many people are would rather just exploit to the maximum the weaknesses of their opponents and and not reveal what they perceive their secrets which are no secrets it's just the hard work that they put in and of course they feel like well you know i did all this work somebody asked me a question it took me a hundred hours to find the answer myself. It was an eye opener, and he wants me to tell it to him in three minutes. You know, that's maybe the nature of poker, right? Because you never show your game, you never show your cards, except yeah. when you have to go all in, you go naked. Yeah. In yeah. chess, you show your moves. You have to play your moves, so you cannot really hide what you what you are doing. So maybe in that sense, there is 
a, a kind of difference between chess and poker. And in poker, yeah, okay, you go all in, you have to show your cards. It's kind of, okay. Now, if you are, I guess, a very strong player, now you would backwards in your head from the pre-flop and you know, think of the steps since that moment. While in chess, you know, the sequence of the moves appear themselves and then you understand, okay, that's why he played queen f5. So that shows himself, he shows himself. So therefore, maybe to analyze is more easier in chess than in poker or to open, you know, your thoughts. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I just... Yeah, I think, I think you're right about it because, um, you know, in chess, the, the moves are exposed anyway. So if you don't discuss it with your opponent after the game, Oh, guess what? Your opponent anyway is going to look into the game and anyway going to analyze it. It's going to take him longer, but he's going to get there, you know, and he's going to talk to his friends. He's going to check the engine. He's going to arrive at the conclusions. So uh, what's the point? Whereas in poker, of course, you know, very often you don't even know what cards your opponent had, which is is the best case for you because you, you basically want to keep them guessing all the time. So yeah, I'm I'm curious if if the poker world is going to find some sort of way around it because obviously in in the modern age it does seem that everything that is more open that is present there on Twitch all of the time it gains more and more popularity and unfortunately I don't see too many top level players willing to share their strategy in the cash game in in the tournaments there's plenty and they are amazing mm-hmm. Because again, like like you said, you know, chess is an easy game to learn, so anybody can get into it. Well, poker is probably an easier game to learn. There, there's less things to consider, right? And uh, but to master, of course, both both games are are quite. There's quite a journey ahead of anybody who just jumps into it. And, and I think that the, the difference also is is money wise because. Uh, you don't play poker without money. You play to win something. I mean, I mean, I believe if, even if it's, a, I mean, I don't even speak about tournaments, but if it's a cash game and if I tell you, okay, you know, let's play poker together, but I don't have any money. Would you accept? Maybe not. While in chess, you know, all of those guys who are streaming on Twitch and YouTube, they play for zero. They just stream themselves. There is no money involved. Hikaru is streaming dozens of hours just because he enjoys to play bullet and to kick the ass of everyone. And he just likes it. And it's understandable, you know? Mm. The guy just likes the process of playing chess. While in poker, if you don't put money, I'm not quite sure the flow would be the same. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because, you know, in in chess, there's the added... uh, benefit of well let's say aesthetics of the game it's just beautiful you know you make a move that is a beautiful move and intellectually it's just you look at it and you think wow this is this is great this was surprising there's not many things equivalent to that in in poker especially because you're trying not to reveal your cards right i mean occasionally you would show a bluff to your opponent but that's really not all that good to, to reveal mm-hmm. your cards when you're not forced to. What, what did you learn from chess that translates to just life, to, to your career right now? What were some of the bigger lessons? Oof, tough one. Um, I think chess somehow has helped me stru- structuring my thoughts and my process of thinking. So you don't go in all the directions, right? Of course, chess is known for strategy, tactics, but it's hard to apply in life. Uh, It has helped me, of course, maybe with my uh, memory. Uh, You know, I'm... so, So in chess, you recognize patterns, position of the pieces and so on. And the patterns... Maybe now I'm trained when I see something 
like uh, we call it photog photogenic memory, something like that, mm -hmm. then it helps me. Okay, I saw that, I can recall it. I'm used to see patterns and reproduce it because I've seen it once and it's enough for me now. Also, it's, as I said, the, the, the best is just structuring my thoughts, trying to be organized. Uh, we were speaking about time management, definitely, you know, when we give you uh, a project and a delivery, I'm really trying to, to, to keep the timings, you know, and how many times in all the companies of the world you, you should deliver a product or a project and, you know, for X, Y, Z reason, it's, will, it's delayed. Uh, so I'm trying to have, a, to have this strict uh, time management process. Uh, I guess yeah, that would be the main points I could transfer to every day's every every day's life. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and especially because you are basically trained to respect the time, because there is no point to make the best move in the world just to time out uh, <laughs> before making yeah. the next one. Exactly. Yeah, very interesting. Even though maybe in at work, they may tell you, okay, take your time to deliver uh, something better. But yeah, you want to ship something which exists rather than nothing. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's, that's the same in chess. Wow, yeah. Oh, well, I, I really wish we could uh, talk much more because there are so many things, you know, we didn't even discuss uh, the AI yet. Well, maybe another time we will, we will get back to that. But I really find it fascinating, you know, the things that, that, that you described about the gaps between the players and just how immense that is. And it, it's just such a beautiful metaphor for basically the whole life of you know if if you are not in a competition if you're not actually comparing yourself against others which normally in any other profession is pretty hard to do you can be under the impression of okay i got this but then you get the wake up call and um and it's just fascinating like what makes the people who achieve the very very top what drives them what makes them go there? You know, we speak about the gap between grandmasters and grandmasters, but a guy like Magnus Carlsen, he has reached the top. I can bet that his goal is to be above 2,900. So he won't, you know, keep going until he breaks this record that was never beaten. And he's like 20, 30 points gap difference. But the guy will be, I think, focused you know, till the end, just to reach that level. And again, it is a small gap, 30 points. It's nothing. But for him, it's taking a huge effort because he has the best rating in the world. He has to, you know, perform what we call plus two or plus four each time he plays. Otherwise, he's going to lose ratings. So if you have to, you know, each time you play against the top players in the world and you have to make at least five wins and five draws without losing, just to win few rating points and you have 30 points to achieve, you know, it takes efforts. So that's again, another gap, but that's, a, you know, we speak about the mm -hmm. best of the best of the best. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Right? And, and maybe AI, and maybe as you were saying, AI will help achieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting that you know AI is available to everyone. Of course, some people have their private engines and they have obviously a team helping them. So it's not like everybody has the same resources. But still, it's clear that just because there is AI, just because there is a lot of information, it doesn't really translate to everyone in the same way. Some people are going to extract more information. Some people are going to be worse with it. I watched um, a very inter interesting show not long ago. Uh, it was from the ITU AI for Good, and Peter I. Nielsen was invited to speak about AI. So there was a guy of uh, Chess24 and Peter I. Nielsen, and the questions were about AI and how Magnus Carlsen actually is using AI to improve in ch his chess. And yeah, Peter I. Nielsen didn't say exactly what 
Magnus was using um, what he was using exactly, uh, whether it's Lila Zero or Alpha Zero, which are the two main AI engines. But he said he discovered that maybe you know attacking on the king side or queen side was sometimes very very powerful rather than attacking and controlling always the center. So AI chess engine also makes you evolve the process. You see the game of chess, and we have discovered a complete crazy new patterns that the AI engine was doing versus a normal engine. Uh, I recall some chess games long ago of uh, Alpha Zero making the queen, you know, on diagonal mm -hmm. back to on H8 back to H1, and then to go back to E4 in the center of the game, completely you know, confusing or in some games, just giving up a full chess piece just to have, you know, the control of the, of the position and you were just stuck. Okay, you have a piece up, you cannot move any pieces. And then the, the, the AI would move and take spaces with his pawns and outplay you. And 20 moves later, you have to give, up, give back your piece, but you are lost. Mm -hmm. So it has, I think it's changing the way the top level uh, grandmasters are seeing the game. Uh, for a normal player, I would say it's super useful, but we don't even understand the extent of the, you know, of what it really gives to the chess game. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that the chess game is definitely evolving on all levels of competition. Because, well, you know, even even people like me, who just play for fun, uh, we have basically the access to almost the same engines that you guys have you know, it's it's incredible mm. yeah well robert i know that you have um, other things to do and uh, i want to thank you so much it was so interesting i i, I hope we're going to get together again and uh, and discuss more because there's so much more to discuss it's uh, uh it's so interesting sure my pleasure it was it was cool Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to get a regular email from me personally where I share my key takeaways from each latest episode, go to runchexpodcast.com and subscribe to my newsletter. And of course, I would really appreciate if you subscribe to my channel on YouTube and rate my podcast on iTunes, Spotify or any other platform where you normally listen to your podcasts. This really helps.